Well, hey everyone, in today's Approaching the Scene, I'm gonna do something kind of fun. I'm gonna go back to one of my absolute favorite panorama images that I created of Mount Hood with this new moonrise in winter. I'm gonna tell the whole story of kind of how I preconceptualized that image, the research that I did, the tools that I took, the adventure that I had capturing it, kind of the, the story behind that image. So approaching the scene of this winter new moonrise over Mount Hood from Larch Mountain. So this is Approaching the Scene. It's a series of weekly videos that I'm doing every Thursday to just kind of spark a conversation about all things photographic and all things visual storytelling from still photography to time lapse to video to the tools that we use that are converging that, that can create all that fun stuff and the professionals in the field working with all the new tools and the changing paradigm of photography. And I, I hope that you'll join the conversation. You can send questions to questions at hudsonhenry.com. You can also go to my website at www.hudsonhenry.com slash ATS and drop a question there. And if you're enjoying this series, I hope you'll click like, I hope you'll click subscribe, I hope you'll share it with friends. Um, so anyhow, let's jump back to 2013 and talk a little bit about this image of Mount Hood. You know, Mount Hood's a really iconic mountain for me. I grew up sort of in its shadow in the mid Willamette Valley where, you know, Mount Jefferson and Mount Hood kind of dominate the landscape and, and, you know, little boys grow up dreaming of going up to the top of those mountains. And, and I had relatives that were climbers and brought back slideshows from climbing trips. And, and I was so excited to climb Mount Hood. Uh, I, I, that was the first big peak that I climbed in my teenage years. And I don't even know how many times I've climbed it at this point. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a favorite mountain of mine. And I think it's, it's kind of an iconic mountain for a lot of us in the Pacific Northwest. When you really look at it, it's got that just classic big mountain shape. And I've been skiing on it and climbing and mountain biking and kiteboarding in its, in its shadow my entire life. And I love finding new and interesting ways to photograph it from different angles. You know, I really love every side of this mountain. Uh, and, and one of my absolute favorite views that I've found is from this spot, Larch Mountain. Now, unfortunately, Larch Mountain is a place that we can't get to right now because of last summer's big wildfire in the Columbia River Gorge. And I'm not sure when the road up into there is gonna be reopened and the trail reopened. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a really, really magnificent place. So mark your, mark your books for when that reopens uh, one of these days. But back in 2013, it was wide open. Uh, however, in the winter, the roads closed by snow. So this really became quite a little adventure journey. Uh, but you know, the lead into it is that I'd spent a bunch of time up there and I got it in my head that it would be really neat to capture an image with Mount Hood from there with the moon behind it. And I'm not really a big compositing guy, as a lot of you know, I like to really get it right in the field, in the camera and hunt down that image that I'm looking for or adapt to whatever situation that I'm dealing with. Uh, and so the first thing you know, I did was I, I started looking at the Photographer's Ephemeris and it's this, this great website. There's also an app for iPhone and Android, but I really like the desktop interface uh, for finding what's gonna be going on with the moon in a distinct location. So here I am, you know, I've found where Larch Mountain is by cruising around. It's kind of a Google map interface, uh, which you can search. I searched for Troutdale and then just scrolled along the roads till I put myself on the Larch Mountain lookout. And here you can see Mount Hood on the map. And this is the actual day that I captured the image and the story we're gonna tell about was February 8th, 2013. You can go to any date in the future or today. If you click on here, there's an easy way to just click today. And the neat thing that this interface does is it shows you where the sun's gonna rise along this line, where the moon's gonna rise along that line. And you can drag this little slider through the hours of the day and see there's that moon rising right to the, uh, to the side of Mount Hood there. So remember Mount Hood's right here and then crossing across it and then the sun rising right after it about, what, an hour later. So the odds of the moon being low over the peak of the mountain right before sunrise when the sun's gonna come and kind of obliterate that sliver moon from the sky were really, really good on this date. And the way that, that I'll often find that is I'll set a pin someplace that I wanna look at and these little clicks right here will just take you one day at a time through the calendar but these bigger clicks will take you through moon phases. So when I click right here, we're at a 50% moon. I click again, we go to the full moon. I click again, we're at a 50% moon. I click again, we're at the new moon. And you can see I'm just going through the calendar and I can see where the moon's gonna be rising in relation to the mountain each time I click. So I could just run through the year looking for the full moons and new moons, where they're gonna be in relation 
to standing on the top of Larch Mountain and, and Mount Hood. And so I do that in locations that I'm going to just to see if there's an interesting moon event, particularly for new moons and full moons. Because if you don't know, the full moon always rises in opposition to the sun. So if the sun's setting in the west, the, new moon is, the full moon is rising at the same time in the east. If the sun is rising in the east, the full moon is setting at the same time in the west. And so you get these interesting opportunities and good light to photograph the moon low on the horizon. Same thing's true of the new moon. The new moon rises as a sliver right with the sun, and it sets right with the sun as a sliver. So if you find that timing around the new moon where it's actually rising a little bit ahead of the sun in blue hour, or setting a little behind the sun in blue hour, say 45 minutes or an hour after sunset, you can get these beautiful images with kind of the afterglow of the sun, lighting the landscape a bit, and that kind of gradient sky with the moon in it. So my first attempt going to Larch Mountain to photograph uh, the full moon behind the mountain, I got a beautiful sort of purple mauve sunset, post-sunset eastern sky with the moon coming down behind the mountain, but it was just really hazy. It was in the autumn, it was about 10 years ago, I think 2008, I really first went up to Larch to get a, a try at this. And it just, it was so hazy from summer forest fires and field burning and just the atmospherics of being on the, the Pacific Northwest coast uh, that, that the, there was no way to get a razor sharp image. It wasn't worth creating a big panorama because it was just going to be kind of hazy. Um, and, you know, I tried in intervening years that one thing or another got in the way or it was cloudy or, you know, whatever. There was just no good chance at doing it until this new moon that I saw, I'd always mark my map for when there's going to be an interesting full moon or new moon from Larch Mountain. And this one new moon, uh, my wife Stacy at the time, I think we were engaged, she was, we, we, she'd just moved to Portland to be with me from Seattle and was working as a doctor. And um, I saw in the, the calendar that, you know, February 8th, new moon rising an hour before the sunrise from Larch Mountain. She'd never been winter snow camping. I said, hey, let's go winter snow camping, assuming the weather's good, and try to capture this image. So long story short, the weather forecast for that day was for the clouds to be clearing. So it was a cloudy kind of rainy day on the 7th, and it was supposed to be a relatively clear day on the 8th. So I didn't know whether that break was going to come after dawn or before dawn. It was a cloudy, bleak day. Stacy had to work. I picked her up after work. We drove up to the, to, the, to the mountain road to Larch Mountain, which is closed about seven miles below the top of the trailhead up there. Um, or the, you know, the top of where the road goes up to the parking lot to take the little trail out to the lookout. There's several things I hadn't really fully considered. So <laughs> that's what makes it such a fun adventure. So we loaded up packs, it was like super fun, it's late evening, we parked the car at the gate where the road was closed and we headed up the road. And by the time, of course, we get to the top, it's pitch black, you know, starting at, at she got off work a little bit early, but we weren't able to start up the road till nearly 5 p.m. So we hiked a lot of the road in the dark, but it is a, it is a road that you can take cars up, so you know, not, not hard to stay on track in the dark. And we got up to the parking lot at maybe 9 p.m., 8.30, p.m. I set up a snow camp there, put Stacy in the tent, and then I realized, you know, when I've gone there in the summer, you park in the parking lot and you're up on this big wooded ridge, and the ridge runs along to kind of a high point, but it's all completely wooded. And the lookout at Larch Mountain that gives you a beautiful view of, of Mount Hood, it's called Shepherd Point, you actually take a trail slightly down off the ridge through the woods, through the deep trees, and then it pops out on this little rock outcrop that has a chain link around it because there's a cliff on all sides. Uh, and and f in the snow, there's no trail. It was just everything was in deep snow. There's probably seven or eight feet of snow up there. So, you know, I started wandering the woods after getting Stacy. We had dinner in the tent, cooked a little freeze-dried meal, and I took off into the woods on snowshoes. And I'm searching and searching and searching, and I wound up on the wrong trail and went way down below where I should be. I think I was on the trail from Larch Mountain down to Multnomah Falls and the gorge, and I had to backtrack and climb back up. Um, and it's starting to get late, and I'm in these deep woods, and I'm thinking, you know, how am I going to find this little out rock outcrop in the middle of all these woods on the ridge? It was the one thing I hadn't thought of, and it was pre, uh, well, you know, I mean, 2013, there were GPS units. I just didn't have one, and I didn't have an app on my smartphone with the, with the location pinpointed. Today, I would get the GPS coordinates and just navigate right to it, but at that point, I hadn't thought of it. 
So I was wandering around and I kept crossing my own trail uh, and I was trying to think of some methodical way, but I was getting a little freaked out because it was maybe 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning and I knew the moon was going to be rising at something like 6.20 and I was running out of time. I thought, what a, what a pitiful waste if I come all the way up here and I'm not able to find the spot to photograph through the trees. Uh, and, and so, you know, what I wound up doing after a while was the stars started to come out. It was clearing like I hoped it would during the night. And as I looked out, I could see there were stars all through the trees. I shut off my light and I just sat still for about 10 minutes and let my eyes adjust to the darkness. And I could see the silhouettes of the trees against the sky with the, with the stars. And so I started looking. I'm up on top of this ridge kind of looking down and I could see that you know there were stars, stars, stars and there was this one place where there, there weren't any stars and I thought that's that little spot where the outcrop comes up through the woods. So I'm literally looking down through the trees and there's this one just black shape down there that didn't have any stars in it. Turn on my headlamp, headed straight down that direction and sure enough you know I'm I'm going along and I hit this little ridge coming up and I realized I was on the trail. There's kind of a little a little saddle that goes out to this rock outcrop and I took the trail up and as I was going along in the dark and my little headlamp light in the woods, I put my foot next to something that looked like the cap of a chain link fence and I realized, whoa, you know, because there is a cliff along this thing and there's kind of a chain link fence to keep anyone from climbing over and off the cliff. Well, the snow had, had, had risen up and actually corniced over that chain link fence a bit and I had almost stepped out onto the cornice and dropped off the cliff. So there were a bunch of hazards here. Um, and I, 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 I put the wider light on, shined it around for a while, got my bearings, realized where I was, climbed out and had found my spot. And so I, I went back along the trail that I'd just taken down to that spot and, and drew arrows every 10 feet pointed towards the, uh, pointed towards the, the shepherd point with my ski pole in the snow. So all the way along and I crossed off all the paths I crossed that were wrong turns, put X's on them and basically drew an arrow path in the snow back to camp. Uh, and when I found Stacy in the tent, she was freaked out because I'd been gone for, I don't know, three and a half hours. She expected me gone for like 20 minutes to go find the point, get things kind of set up, drop a couple tripods and come back. Instead, you know, she felt like maybe something had happened to me and she's on her first snow camping trip and she's all alone in the dark in the tent. <laughs> so, you know, poor planning on my part. Next time you take walkie talkies, GPS, you avoid all this stuff, but that's how we learn, right? So anyhow, I set my alarm for three hours later, went to sleep for maybe two and a half hours, a sort of fitful rest in the snow camping tent, got up, tried not to wake her up, went back down the trail and as I set up, sure enough, that new moon was just coming up over the left shoulder of Mount Hood, still really dark. You know, there was just a, almost, you know, barely any pre-dawn glow, just a little blue on the horizon. And I had carried two tripods and, and two camera bodies. I had a Nikon D700 at the time and a brand new D800, which was really exciting to me. And my plan was to make a big high resolution D800 panorama while doing some time lapse with the D700, you know, of the sunrise and of the moonrise. I didn't know, I was hoping for clouds and as I got up there I realized there was low mist hanging down in the valley that looked like it would probably be moving in a cool way for time lapse. So I set up the D700, started the time lapse, did a few uh, test shots with the D800 as the moon was coming up and just kind of waited for that right moment. And I, I was using a ball head at that point. It was the winter before I went to Denali with my good friend Andy and filmed an American uh, Ascent where I really, really became a huge aficionado of the fluid head and stopped using ball heads. So I was using a ball head, not unlike this, this last one that I have left. I was using a Arca Swiss Z1 at the time. And to do a pano with a ball head, it's really important to have one of these panning clamps uh, because the ball head, typically pans below the ball and you level with the ball and then the minute that you pan from below it's no longer staying level. So having a panning clamp lets you just level the head with that clamp on the top of it like that and then you can loosen this and just pan the whole clamp. And because this particular image everything in it was out at the infinity focus length from, uh, from my camera and I I don't know if anybody's read my, my book on simple panoramas. 
that means there's no worry about parallax with close objects moving in relation to distant objects. So I didn't need to worry about using a, a nodal slider to get out over the no parallax point. I just needed to be able to rotate nice and level, put my camera vertical so that I'm capturing more sky and more foreground. And you know, I knew from previous trips up there I was gonna want a long lens for this. I think I photographed it somewhere right around 105, 110 millimeters on my Nikon 70 to 200 zoom that I had at the time. And just, you know, when the color started getting good, I used the live view on the back of the Nikon D810 or D800 and had that grid view and just photographed with a lot of overlap that whole scene. And I ran through multiple times, but once I got the images that I wanted, then I just kind of waited around for the sunrise and, and played with some different focal lengths and wound up shooting some sun stars as just the sun started poking over the ridge. I reset the time lapse to do a time lapse of the sun rising. Um, and, and then woke, went back down to the tent. Once the sun was up, it was a pretty clear day. There was a little cloud down below, but once you have a sunrise and that kind of a blue sky day, particularly in winter, you know, there's, there's not much left to photograph. I took some shots of the surrounding mountains. Mount St. Helens is really pretty from there. Um, and some of the cloud down below being lit. And then I just went down, woke Stacy up. We had a really nice morning up there. Uh, and by the time I got back with her, the cloud was already rising up and kind of obscuring the mountain. It only blew away a little bit for a second. She didn't even really get a good view of Mount Hood uh, because things just changed so quickly once the sun rose. It was really all the little pieces came together and I wouldn't say that I captured exactly the image that I pre-visualized in my mind that I was gonna get of that new moon over Mount Hood, but what I got I think is even better than what I, what I pre-visualized. And I, I absolutely love the fact that it's a high resolution panorama. You know, it's, it's what's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 36 megapixel images merged. Uh, and I've got it printed eight feet wide in my living room. It's been printed huge uh, in, in different uh, big buildings around downtown Portland. Um, and it's, it's just one of my favorite images I've ever captured. And I think it goes to say that, you know, there are times when serendipity strikes and you unexpectedly have this amazing moment that you get out there and capture. But I think that a lot of the awe-inspiring images that we see out there are not captured like that. They're often, a, the result of a lot of research, a lot of time, a lot of work, someone getting up really early, someone really struggling to get out and, and going to a place more than once, spending time with it, really getting a feel for, you know, what do I want to capture about this place, doing some research, you know, putting yourself in that position. Now, I could have just as easily been out there and had a complete heavy overcast and not gotten the image that I was after. But one thing's for sure, if I don't make the effort to get up there, if I don't go searching through those woods, I'm not going to, I'm not going to capture anything. Uh, and so I think that's part of the joy of photography for me it is just the, the puzzle of figuring out how to capture what you're after uh, and then the adventure of it and then being able to come back and tell the story with images. Uh, so, you know, I, I hope you enjoyed this little look behind one of my absolute favorite images. Again, if you're enjoying this series of, of videos, you know, please click like, please click subscribe. Send me questions at questions at hudsonhenry.com or go to the website at www.hudsonhenry.com slash ATS. Uh, and, and I actually, I had a question from last week that's really pertinent to this. It's a, a question about when my advanced panorama uh, video course series is gonna be coming out. And I can say I'm putting the wraps on a really cool core photography course uh, that should be out in a matter of just a couple of weeks or so. Uh, and the, the panorama photography course is essentially shot. I've got a couple of post-production videos I need to wrap up, uh, and that will be coming out shortly thereafter. So definitely before Thanksgiving, you're going to have a shot at both the core photography video course and the, the panorama course. So anyhow, we'll see you guys next week. I hope you'll join the conversation. Send me those questions. This is a ton of fun.